Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life and all seasons, including spring forward. Hallelujah. It is my great joy to be with this congregation as we strive to live into our mission of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. And in living that mission, we recognize how we are part of a great network of relationships, past, present, and future. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were among the nations who called this place home long before the first European settlers came down to Illinois River. And so every time we gather in worship, we honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank everybody for joining us in person and online. It is truly something to be extending ourselves into the world, to get to know each other, to just say, I want to do something different and new in my life, and how can I do that with help and with a community? Please help us get to know you in that spirit if you are new or visiting the congregation. We have lots of name tags. You're welcome to join us after service in Fellowship Hall for coffee. Uh, and also, if you are joining us electronically on Zoom, by all means, stay and visit there as well. Uh, I do want to say that it is, always, uh, it is always an interesting morning when it's spring forward. It is one of the wild cards Sundays in uh, congregational life. So thank you for being here. And if you arrive later, thank you for being here as well in all the ways that we gather. Now is the time uh, I want to invite folks uh, as we gather together to uh, check your devices to make sure they are in worship mode, whether silent or buzzy. And also, if you are near needing uh, hearing assist, assist devices, you're welcome to ask for those anytime from our greeters and ushers as well. And I also want to add a note uh, of appreciation for uh, Jean Sloan and fa family. We have a little additional flowers from Adam Sloan's memorial service that folks gathered for yesterday. Now today's service uh, continues with exploring our monthly theme of vulnerability uh, and we'll be talking about uh, how we introduce ourselves one to another and what does that matter in our world. Uh, but we also we also have, kind of in that spirit of getting to know you, we have Girl Scout Sunday this morning, and some of our scouts, we have an array of scouts in the front row. Hi. And uh, some of the scouts are assisting with the service today, and, and there's cookies. There's cookies to be enjoyed and bought after the service today, so I want to invite folks to do that as well in Fellowship Hall. This also was... Uh, Part of our effort to be welcoming folks in, this is what we're calling Bring a Friend Sunday. When I mean, every Sunday should be a Bring a Friend Sunday, am I right? But, but today we're saying, yes, let's do that today in particular. Now maybe spring forward is not optimal, but cookies are compelling and so we're gonna go with that. Thank you for joining us today in all the ways that we gather. Uh, next Sunday, I want to bring your attention. Uh, we have a special, uh, uh, gathering after service next Sunday. We're calling it the all-church check-in. Uh, so we will gather in Fellowship Hall uh, during coffee hour around the round tables, and we'll take an appreciative inquiry approach to checking in about how we're doing as a congregation. What is going well? What is going well? And what might change or be even better? And just plain, what are your questions? What are what are your burning questions or just kind of curiosity or what would you like to know about what's going on in the congregation right now? Uh, and the results of this conversation will help inform the board and myself as we set our priorities for the coming year. And I really want to invite everybody to be part of this. All ages are welcome. And now, uh, new to our services this month is the return of greeting our neighbors. Uh, before the pandemic, worship included a time to turn and say a brief hello to folks who were gathering in the sanctuary. And now the worship committee uh, and I feel like we could return to this practice. Uh, so we'll be trying it out in the, at this point in the service for the next few months. And I appreciate your feedback uh, about how this goes. So I invite you in this moment, as you are comfortable and able, 
to introduce yourself to folks next, nearby. Uh, physical contact is not required. Please ask before offering a hug or a handshake because consent is how we are part, part of how we gather together. And if you are online also, I invite you to say hello in the chat. And so after the greeting, our neighbor is in process, I will call us back with the beginning of our first hymn. So please, greet your neighbor. Wonder, worshiper, lover of leaving causes no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are. Wonder, worshiper, lover of leaving causes no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. So as we enter into singing our first hymn, uh, this is one that we have been working on, and we're going to keep working it up, working on it for uh, this month, uh, uh, that we add the counterpoint in addition to the familiar verse. So we'll start with the counterpoint, which is, though you've broken your vows a thousand times, we'll sing that through three times, and then we'll sing the verse three times. Mm. Oh, dear. Though you've broken your vows a thousand times, though you've broken your vows a thousand times, though you've broken your vows a thousand times, come, come, wherever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of me. Yet again, come, 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 whoever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of me, cause is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come, 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 whoever you Lover of me, of despair, come yet again, come. Is it on? It's on. Come gather in by Andrea Hawkins Camper. In the house of the holy, the world pauses. In the hearts of the holy, love abides. In the heavens of the holy, hope comforts. In the hearts of this holy, in the hearts of the holy, spirit refreshes. Come then, one and all, gather in. 
Come then, one and all, gather here. Bring here all of your heart, bring here all of your body, bring here all of your soul. Come then, bring the broken, the vulnerable, the ragged, the outcast, the other. Come then, gather in, come. Come then, one and all, gather in, come then, gather in. We would like to invite Abby up. We light this chalice to find inner peace, love for each other, and faith for ourselves. Also to be welcome, to be welcoming to whoever we meet and kind to all living creatures. So gather around this light of hope as we share this time together. So in our gathering, part of what we recognize and honor in any given service is all the gifts that we bring, all the ways in which something that has been offered from the past by so many people, by so many generations, has been handed down from generation to generation and has taken so many forms of our lives, our money, our talent, our skills, our vision. And part of what we do in this moment is recognize the abundance of gifts that are among us by the act of taking up the offering during worship. And we do this action as a tangible recognition of the generosity that is with us, as well as the value of simply giving as a spiritual practice. Um, and so we do that as a congregation in worship. But what we also do as a congregation is share a bit of that abundance out into the world through our Share the Plate program. And every month we have a different recipient, um, especially picked by the uh, Social Impact Committee. And so for this month, our Share the Plate recipient is the 100 Black Men of Central Illinois. Uh, the Bloomington Peoria chapter began in December 2003 and provides services and programs to the local Black community including economic seminars, health and wellness fairs, and post-high school scholarships. Now, through their Mentoring for Life program, volunteers work with kids ages 8 to 18 to forge long-term relationships that help address their social, emotional, and cultural needs. And so this, as a body, is a 501c3 charity that receives no government funding, that really relies on the generosity of the community in order to sustain and keep offering such an important ministry. Uh, so I want to invite folks, if you want to check it out, there's certainly a website, uh, 100 Black Men of Central Illinois, Inc., or Facebook. You can also ask uh, Lisa Beaupre, the member of the congregation who uh, coordinates the Share the Plate program for this congregation. So if you are uh, in the offering, uh, if that's part of your pledge or part of the share the plate, please indicate that in the memo line in a check. Yes, we do pay things by check these days still. Yes, but all the ways that we can give. Um, and also indicate that in, in, on the envelope if you are offering cash. And now after the plates, uh, the ushers will pass the plates. And after those have been passed during our music for meditation, folks are welcome to come forward and light candles of care. And so now, will the ushers please come forward?
Here we have come into the sacred space, quieter now with our readiness, hushed voices, hoping, trusting for so many things, for connection, for communion, for inspiration, for information, for healing, for wholeness, for words, for music, for celebration, and consolation. Here we have come into the space bringing all of who we are. Let us be willing. Let us be willing to be here, however we may be changed. And now is the time for the sharing of the joys and sorrows of the congregation. And we begin with a joy and congratulations to Terry and Tom Malone. They celebrated 47 years of wedded bliss, their words, wedded bliss, on March 6th. So congratulations to Tom and Terry. I want to offer a note of thanks uh, for everybody who was part of Adam Sloan's memorial service yesterday. We had a sanctuary full of people. We had lots of socializing afterwards. Um, the Sunday service uh, treats, I think, will include, I think there's like cold pizza, so go for it. You know, pizza, then cookies, right? Pizza, then cookies. <laughs> That's a good combination today. So I really want to thank everybody for being part of remembering Adam and 
welcoming his family here, and it is lovely to see folks, uh, to see Jean here this morning as well. We turn to wishes for health. Uh, we send wishes for complete and speedy recoveries to Mary Mahal and Kafar, who is recovering at home after a hospital day, stay that included surgery, and Mary welcomes cards and visits. Uh, and also, we offer our wishes to Kay Cook, who is receiving rehab services at Hopedale Commons. Uh, and Kay also welcomes cards and visits. You can see the Friday email for the address there. And now we turn to sympathy. Uh, we offer our sympathy and condolences to Ruby Young and Sal, uh, Stephen Alvin as they mourn the loss of Stephen's father, Stephen Alvin. Uh, he died at age 95 uh, in Henry, Illinois. He passed on February 27th. And we also offer our sympathy to Barbara Pierce, who is, while still mourning uh, the recent loss of her sister, Glenna Howard, now also mourns the loss of her brother, James Means, of Bellevue, Illinois. He died at age 77, suddenly, unexpectedly, on March 7th. So let us offer an extra note of sympathy to Barbara as well. Now I invite us, in this moment, in this circle of care, to hold one more moment of quiet, for all of the joys and sorrows, all the names and milestones, all that is with us and within us and around us and in our lives as well as our greater world. Let us hold this moment and be present to it in the shared quiet that we offer together. But somehow in the moment of doing so, not simply by ourselves, but in the company that we gather, that there is something of strength and consolation in this moment. Let us hold one more moment of quiet. Amen and namaste. And now I invite our scouts up for our story today. Today we are celebrating Girl Scout Sunday. The girls in our congregation who are active scouts have stepped in to help, with, to help serve with several roles in worship. I'm sure there are many former Girl Scouts in our congregation as well. As we say, once a Girl Scout, always a Girl Scout. So if you've ever been a member of Girl Scouts, we invite you to stand at this time. <laughs> A lot of the values we hold dear in Unitarian Universalism can be heard in the Girl Scout law. All current and former Girl Scouts are welcome to join us in making the Girl Scout sign and reciting the law, if you can recall it now. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, responsible for what I say and what respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, and make the world a better place and be a sister to every Girl Scout. Thank you for joining us in saying that. You may now sit down. Girl Scout Sunday is an annual celebration in the United States. It observes, it, obs, it observes on Sunday closest to March 12th, the anniversary of the founding of Girl Scouts. In 1911, Julia Gordon Lowe, the founder of Girl Scouts, met Lord Baden Powell, the founder of Boy Scouts, in England, where she participated in leading Girl Guides. 
When Julia Gordon Lowe returned to America, she brought scouting back with her. In 1912, she started the first Girl Scout troop in Savannah, Georgia. In 1917, uh, Miss, Mrs. Alice Wilson, a member of the First Universalist of Peoria, brought Girl Scouts right here to Peoria, Illinois. Four years later, in 1921, Peoria Girl Scouts needed a helping hand. They found, they found that help in the First, Univer in the first Univ Universalist Church of Peoria. On November 7th, 1921, in the parlors of the church, the council was formed. That's right. Our church was the first home of the Peoria Council of Girl Scouts. <laughs> that support continued for years. At a church board meeting on April 13th, 1923, that's the support of the church was pledged to the Girl Scouts, and for at least the next decade, Troop Number 2 met at our church and was led by, by, a church, by church member Mrs. Lottman. The church's social club helped support the troop through sewing projects and donation to its treasury. This tradition has continued. The Girl Scouts in our congregation are cheerfully participating through the year. As an added bonus, today we will be selling Girl Scout cookies after worship in Fellowship Hall. I know I'll see you there. The kids are now invited to children's religious education, and the adults can sing us out in Go Now in Peace. Our reading today is from one of our late Universalist elders, the Reverend Gordon McKeeman. I stretch forth my hand, knowing not what I shall touch. A tender spot, an open wound, warmth, pulsing life, fragile blossoms, a rock, Ice. I am tentative, trembling, wishing to avoid hurt, wanting to link my life with life. Lonely, I desire companions. Naked, I long for defenders. Lost, I want to find and to be found. Will I touch strangers or enemies or nothing? My hand is withdrawn and still it touches my vulnerable skin, my furrowed brow, my empty pocket, my full heart. Do others reach, tremble, withdraw? Do they desire, long, or seek? Are they lonely, fearful, or lost? Will they grasp a tentative, trembling hand? I stretch forth my hand, knowing not what I shall touch, but hoping. Here ends the reading. Please rise and body your spirit. Join me for our hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. We will listen once and sing through the verses together. Thank you. 
The most radical thing we can do is connect people to one another. The most radical thing we can do is connect people to one another. That starts a conversation toward a vision for change. I take this as my text this morning from Rosabeth Moss Cantor. Uh, she is a sociologist and business consultant who, in particular, talks about. Uh, management and change and culture in corporations. But her early studies focused on uh, communities, utopias even. And so she brings that sense of what creates connection and strength between people in any context into uh, a long-term, uh, a long culture and uh, uh, career in advising and is still, she's been going strong for decades and still comes back to uh, Twitter and advising and consulting and mentoring. The most radical thing we can do is connect people one to another. That starts a conversation toward a vision for change. Now, sometimes I've heard this as the most radical thing we can do is introduce people to one another. Amen. I like that one as well. But I want to spend a little bit moment on the radical part. Because I think radical, I think sometimes gets a bad rap in our social conversations. And in fact, might be a little bit overused. So let's spend a moment. Uh, because radical, I think, has often had the uh, connection to being a a real, a profound change. It's a real flipping of the tables, if you will. It's shifting everything all at once. But my interest in this moment, my interest is in the other meaning uh, that's commonly is radical as the root, the core, uh, the premise, where things kind of begin from. So for me, the heart of a conversation is what is the deepest need? What is the, the foundation? Because looking at that, the root of something, where we come from, that exercise by itself often is part of the path to change. To remember to ask, what are we really doing here? Why are we here? And that question alone reminds us of our aspirations, particularly as a religious community, but also simply as human beings. The most radical thing we can do, the most profound foundational act among us is to connect. And so I'm wondering, I want to offer in this moment, when has a meeting, when has a connection really changed your life? And largely I'm talking about for the better, but sometimes, but also in unexpected ways. You can do that on the very microcosm of things, you know, the individual relationship. I remember when um, uh, my spouse and I met, I was entirely in my first ministry in Alabama, didn't know a soul, wandered, uh, agreed to be part of the installation of a colleague at the group 
biggest congregation we have in Atlanta, walked into that building not knowing a soul. And there we were lined up as ministers and robes and stoles to process into this installation. And we got to comparing stoles, you know, hey, what's yours like? What's mine like? Where did it come from? And there was the meat cute that now ended up, you know, getting married, which is great. There we go. But that's the individual. On the grander scale, uh, in college, I had the opportunity to attend the march in Washington, D.C., uh, that was there for the right to choose. I think this was 1994 or so. And in that moment, in that moment, I got to experience what it meant to be amongst a million people. A million people, you know, with an M, like the million people, spread out across the mall in Washington. And to do so in person, not simply in photos, which also is pretty powerful, I will say, but to have the embodied experience of being around that many people. And from that, I got to have the sense of the, the vastness of humanity, the vastness of the moment, and had a chance a year, about a year or so after, a year plus later, to return to the mall in Washington, D.C., so I could see, my friends and I could see the AIDS quilt in its entirety for the last time in 1995. A whole other way of understanding the vastness. In this case, the vastness of love and sorrow mixed together. When has a connection changed your life? led to greater comprehension on any scale? When has simply being introduced been a profound shift that about the core of who you are as a person or about the core of a community or your family or connection? I recognize that we are in, as human beings, a constant journey in this effort to connect. And of course, with it, doesn't just bring like the wonderful things, but also the struggling pieces, the parts of life that are hard. And in that, I recognize that part of what we also do as humans is learn to protect ourselves from being wounded, uh, from the experience of being harmed when we have tried to reach out and tried to simply be part of wherever we are. Brene Brown talks about this. Uh, as children, she says, we found ways to protect ourselves from vulnerability, from being hurt or diminished or disappointed. We put on armor. We used our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors as weapons. We learned to make ourselves scarce even disappear. And now as adults, we realize that to live with courage and purpose and connection, to be the person whom we long to be, we must again be vulnerable. We must take off the armor, put down the weapons, show up and let ourselves be seen. We must let ourselves be seen. But it takes practice, it takes time, it doesn't happen all at once, as I know that we all know in each and our own way. One of the ways that I think this uh, armor, this protection can appear, can manifest in our lives, uh, can be more focused on the doing rather than the being. Like how many of us you know, kind of really like to focus on, I know how to get a laundry list done, but don't ask, but, but I'm not really going to send over here and do silent meditation all that often. Or how can I simply be one with myself, right? Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh points this out, that we are very good at appearing to live, at preparing to live, he says, but not very good at living. We know how to sacrifice 10 years for a diploma, and we are willing to work very hard to get a job, a car, a house, and so on. But we have difficulty remembering that we are alive in the present moment. 
the only moment there is for us to be alive. We have difficulty remembering that we are alive in the present moment, the only moment there is for us to be alive. As human beings, we are so good at doing. So good at doing. I think part of the core of the question of connection in this, the most radical thing we can do, is how well we are at being. I think the opportunity, the, the other way of understanding the quote from, uh, from Cantor is the most radical thing we can do is introduce each other, is to offer an invitation. And I like this idea of the possibility of an invitation because to me, as I thought about this, invitation is this merging of doing and being. We extend and wait and are present to each other. In Girl Scouts is a good example of the doing and the being, um, all about the connection and the power therein. Now I'm gonna say Girl Scouts, like any human institution, is uh, certainly full of its own social navigation and awkwardness and bullying and all the things that go along with humans trying to figure out each other. I mean, I remember that I was there. You know, summer camp can be a little socially weird. And it can be sometimes one of those places where we learn social protection, and that's true of any situation. But also, but also the spirit of invitation, as manifest in its origin and as I think showing up uh, as we're recognizing we're just a month out from the 100th anniversary of this congregation officially saying, yes, uh, Girl Scouts are here. There is something so wonderful and profound and hopeful about extending that invitation again and again and again. You know, Girl Scouts is a product of its time as we've been navigating uh, through generations at this point. You know, in the past, it was about home economics. It was about creating the model young woman. But it has been evolving. We have been learning how to connect one with each other. Um, scouting as my mother do, knew it is different than my experience, and my daughter has her own experience in this generation. It's about uh, a lot of different aspects of life. It was how I was able, for, for me, Girl Scouts is, uh, was about the opportunity to observe surgery in my local veterinarian's offices. Right, as well as the camping, as well as the cooking, as well as the friendship, and so on. It is full of high expectations to be challenging us and holding us forward to say, how can we keep connecting one with each other to become more fully human, to be serving others, to extend compassion, to meet and seek equality? Those ideals alone are at the radical root here of connection was that song from summer camp, you know, make new friends, but keep the old one is silver and the other gold, right? That's one of the strongest songs I have in my association with scouts. And now, and now scouting continues to evolve in its commitment uh, now to diversity, equity, and inclusion, racial justice that has been reaffirmed and strengthened after George, George Floyd's murder in 2020. But it's also as, uh, as a body welcoming and expanding, uh, including the range of gender experience as we've been evolving in human uh, society. From the Girl Scout website, they say, if the child is recognized by the family and school and community as a girl and lives culturally as a girl, then Girl Scouts is an organization that can serve her in a setting that is both emotionally and physically safe. Talk about radical in this moment, yes? Girl Scouts is an organization that can serve her in a setting that is both emotionally and physically safe. The most radical thing we can do is connect and introduce, and from there, 
we keep expanding our vision. As part of the core of our purpose from author Kurt Vonnegut, he says, what should young people do with their lives today? Many things, obviously, but the most daring thing, the most daring thing is to create, a sta to create stable communities in which the terrible disease of loneliness can be cured. The most daring thing is to create stable communities in which the terrible disease of loneliness can be cured. I think Vonnegut's thought pairs well with that radical thing of connection, yes? This radical invitation into yet another practice of love, in fact. If you were present for last week's service, we included an exploration of the nature of love from African-American author Bell Hooks, who talked about love as the extension of the self for the sake of the other. The extension of the self for the sake of the other and how that is at the heart of human longing, even when we see and the practice of love fail again and again. This desire for connection is so compelling, even when we are scared, even when we've been harmed. And yet we keep wanting and hoping and practicing. Love itself is a practice, in practice is risk. It is getting to that sense of risk so that we might enlarge ourselves, hope for another, care for the other, as well as our own hearts. You know, this month, this weekend, in fact, is the third anniversary of when the world shut down in response to the pandemic. I know there's a range of mixed feelings about that. Year one was survival. Year two was kind of impossible with vaccinations and politics and economics and social questions. And now year three. Year three is learning how to do community again. How to do church again, even while living with um, the social and individual ripples and scars and, and deaths and changes in priorities. That radical thing that's been going on has been going on by people saying, what is truly important to me and how shall I live in this moment? And the pandemic was the absolute um, overwhelming context in which we did this as individuals and as a society and as a world. We are discovering again. So this is why I wanted to get back to this radical thing, this root, this foundation because we are in this process of discovery. And it's still present, this work. I was noticing the last few weeks how I've actually had more conversations in recent weeks about uh, bringing out yet again how challenging it was to start this ministry. Um, in August 2020, my coming to the congregation, us being here together and figuring it out. Um, Facebook memories, for example, kind of brought this out recently uh, with a photo I had taken of the whole front of the congregation. I'd taken it from the back of the sanctuary. And this was a moment when both the screens, we had scaffolding up on both sides, co totally covering the walls. And the screens, the covers were taken, were off, but the old screens hadn't been there. They were, hadn't been taken down. They were still there. And it was totally a work in progress. It was a hot mess in the sanctuary, I'm going to just tell you. It truly was. And it truly changed the face of the experience of being in here as well. But what was also at the moment, because that first year was when we were recording all the services. You remember that? I do. That, and the pulpit was canted out. And we had a camera right here and lights and lights over here because the entirety of the experience of the church had gone from this that we are gathered in into this, into this, and what we could see from each other on screen. So we have gone from that, that moment, into this. 
Into this we are gathered in person, into this we where we are also on screens in all the ways that we gather. So we are in this moment of figuring it all. It doesn't, it doesn't just change in an instant. The world shut down in an instant, but it doesn't come back in the same moment. So we are, in fact, in this radical introduction of wondering and wandering and how shall we be together and introducing and reintroducing ourselves. And so in this moment, in the spirit of this, the theme of vulnerability, in this moment of recognizing where we are in this year, I want to offer an invitation and I want to offer an extension. I've even had some of the questions, um, some questions I've had come to me recently. You know, does the minister visit? Yes. I didn't used to, because, you know, masking. But now, yes. And I want to invite all of us to be visiting with each other. But by all means, if there is somebody who you think I need to reach out to, I want to know. Because we are in this moment of doing this and creating this together. And I can't know all the things. You can't know all the things. This, we need to be introducing ourselves to each other yet again and again. And I certainly want to recognize and thank everybody who's brought, uh, you know, took up the spirit of the Bring a Friend to Church Sunday this morning. And thank you for being here and bringing the people that you know and love into the space as well. This is what we do again and again. It's the doing and the being together. Let me close with some words from the Reverend Gretchen Haley. She wrote them yesterday. They were inspired by Spring Forward, but I think they speak to a lot in this moment. Count up the hours, the minutes, the moments. Call them all gifts, and then keep calling until the praise comes like breath, and all we have left is gratitude. Time is too quick to give away without noticing. We need an accounting of abundance, a space for celebration, that we have survived and keep surviving, that we are for more than ourselves, that we are in the struggle and we get to sing. We get to sing. Bring your sleepy eyes and your weary heart, your worried mind and your racing thoughts, but don't forget the joy. Don't forget the joy borrowed or brought or caught in your chest, ready to tumble at every word that comes from your tongue. That thirst for beauty and life found in community, held in courage that is more than your own. Come, let us worship. Come, let us gather. Come, let us invite each other in and take that chance yet again. That most radical thing we can do is connect one to another that starts conversation toward a vision for change. Let us go forth in continuing that invitation again and again. Let us go forth. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn, number 126, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We will listen once and sing through together.
the price of our false island. Feel our love go like the sun. When we see one another, then our heaven is begun. Come the fount of inspiration, our lives to my ways. Lift our grief and desperation. The promise of this day. Help us find ourselves in you. Help our hands tell of our love. With a halo found of justice, earth be fair as heaven above. Knowing how quickly the flame of truth may be extinguished, how easily the chalice of fellowship broken, let us be vigilant in faith, keep peace in our hearts, and make care for one another the watchwords of our lives together so our light may go out everywhere into the world. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Oh, that's good. 